So for our final section of this unit, we are going to talk about the Tudor dynasty. Now we already talked about the Tudor dynasty briefly to introduce it at the end of our Middle Ages unit. Um, we talked about how following the Hundred Years War, um, England was basically um, sent into this civil war, this conflict for control over the monarchy. Um, and so that's going to be kind of the starter for this story. Now, with this lesson, it is divided into an eight-part story. So you'll watch each story and fill in the notes. Uh, there's lots of different characters um, that we're going to hear about. Um, and we're also going to hear about some of the very interesting dynamics of this family. Um, this is pretty much a historical soap opera almost of backstabbing and uh, all kinds of different things. So let's start with part one, which starts with the event that we discussed previously, which was called the War of the Roses. Um, so after the War of the Roses, which was this civil war in England uh, following the Hundred Years War, if you remember, we talked about this is where we have two families, the House of York and the House of Lancaster, battling con for control over England and who's going to be the next king of England. And in the end, the winner of that battle was a guy named Henry Tudor. And so Henry du Tudor is going to start off this new family dynasty that we call the Tudor dynasty. He's also going to become Henry VII, which is V-I-I. -I. Um, if you're filling that in on your notes, um, if you're not good with Roman numerals, I always suggest writing it out as is with the Roman numerals and then after in parentheses putting the number just to kind of help yourself. So Henry the Tudor becomes Henry VII and he becomes King of England. So what's interesting about Henry Tudor and Henry VII, as well as many of the other monarchs of this time period, is that they have a very interesting practice because this time period is one where there's a lot of competition between the different um, kind of global European powers like England, France, Spain, Portugal, et cetera, et cetera. Those big kind of powerhouse um, countries in this time period. And they have this policy where they believe that if they marry off uh, their children to each other, then in turn what that does is it creates kind of a political alliance between them um, because you would be less likely to attack or hurt someone that, let's say, your child is married to their child. Um, it just kind of creates a natural alliance between those sides. Um, and hopefully that would mean that there would be peace and it would kind of reduce conflict. Um, so Henry VII practices this belief that marrying off his children to other countries' royals will create political alliances. Just to kind of give you an example, um, he had actually um, married off his 13-year-old daughter, Margaret, to um, James IV of Scotland, and that would unify those two regions um, that form a good chunk of modern day United Kingdom or Great Britain. Um, and so he was constantly trying to look for ways to make alliances. So he is going to do this with his daughters, his sons. And so his eldest son was a guy named Arthur Tudor. And he had Arthur Mary, Spain's princess, and her name is Catherine of Aragon. 
Catherine of Aragon, and she actually, you might um, recognize the names of her parents. Her parents were Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, who were the king and queen that famously uh, backed Christopher Columbus in his journeys and exploration. Um, but Arthur and Catherine, they get married, and this is supposed to create an alliance between England and Spain. And Spain was a major, major world power at that time. Um, they were probably the top dog in Europe because they were a very strong uh, country financially. They also had great, great success with exploration. We'll talk about that more in our next unit. Um, but they were very much kind of becoming one of the early superpowers of Europe at that time. So naturally, England, which is still kind of um, an up-and-coming country in that time period, they want to ally themselves with them. So this marriage was to create that alliance. But there's a little problem. Arthur is going to die. And because he dies and it's so sudden... Now, all of a sudden, um, Henry VII fears that this political alliance is going to be ruined because now um, Catherine is basically without a husband. So, Arthur being gone, now Henry VII decides, well, I can solve this problem and instead I'm going to have you marry my younger son, which is a guy by the names of Henry VIII. So he marries Henry, she marries Henry VIII, and this is to maintain the connection between the two countries. So now Catherine basically ends up marrying her brother-in-law um, all because of this political alliance. Now at the time, Catherine is probably in her early 20s and Henry VIII would have been about 17. So they were still a young couple, get married. And then shortly after they are married, Henry VII dies. And this makes Henry VIII king. So now Henry VIII becomes king of England and he is um, in charge. So what we see happen is now that the two are married, they have a very important responsibility. The most important responsibility for a royal couple is to produce what we call a male heir. And Henry becomes obsessed, obsessed with producing a male heir. What we mean by a male heir is someone to basically carry on the family name, um, take the throne after you're gone. Um, so he absolutely needs to have a son to do this. This is kind of his obsession. Um, and at the time, if you remember, we talked about how boys were favorable to girls. Um, and that was very common. So he wants a son. So him and Catherine are trying to produce uh, their heir and Catherine gets pregnant. Um, but instead of producing a male heir, they produce a daughter and her name is Mary the First. So that is part one of our story.